Welcome back to Monitors Unbox. Today we're finally checking out the Samsung Odyssey OLED G9, the G95SC model to be specific, after months and months of waiting for this product to ship. A quick backstory to this one, I purchased an OLED G9 back in November of 2023 after Samsung never responded to my emails inquiring about this product. I would have ordered it earlier, except Samsung wouldn't even ship this big boy to my address until they updated their delivery system in November, and even then it took several months due to high demand and low stock. Anyway, it's here now and ready for a full review. The OLED G9 is a wider version of Samsung's popular OLED G8 that debuted early last year. It features a 49 inch 5120 by 1440 resolution panel, the equivalent of two 27 inch 2560 by 1440 monitors stitched together into a big super ultra wide with a 32 by 9 aspect ratio. The panel uses second generation QD OLED technology, the same we saw in ASUS's similar PG49 WCD last year, with the refresh rate the tops out at 240 Hz. It supports adaptive sync technology, it has rated 0.03 millisecond response times, and display HDR True Black 400 certification. While the official MSRP for this product is $1800 US, it has regularly been seen for around $1300 for several months now, falling in price along with many other OLED gaming monitors towards the back end of 2023. A competitive price for sure compared to other displays like this, though still a high-end product for those after a flagship gaming monitor. As regular viewers of Monitors Unboxed may know, I am a fan of ultra-wide gaming. I typically use a 21 by 9 aspect ratio display as my daily gaming monitor. These 49 inch displays are especially wide. The OLED G9 is 1.2 meters wide, so you'll need a decent sized desk to accommodate it, but it's not overly tall relative to most other monitors. We're looking at 40 centimeters of additional width versus traditional 21 by 9 ultra wides, so it feels more immersive to use while gaming and offers more screen real estate for side by side productivity applications. The downside being that while game support is pretty good these days for ultra wides, 32 by 9 is less supported than 21 by 9 and 16 by 9, so you may run into titles that don't support this type of format without mods or hacks, but the newer the game you're playing, the less likely this will be an issue in my experience. It is a curved monitor, though the curve is standard and not too aggressive at 1800R. I think this gives it a nice balance between bringing the edges in a bit for immersive gaming while not distorting the image too much for desktop app usage. A flat panel of this width I don't think would be very good. The wider the screen, the more justifiable the curve is, especially at normal desk viewing distances. The design is very similar to the OLED G8, but with a few small tweaks that improve the package. The outer surfaces are still silver plastic or metal, with a thin build that looks great in my opinion. The stand has been widened a bit, especially at the base, to keep it stable with such a large panel, but the amount of desk width necessary to house the stand is surprisingly small. I also appreciate the base is flat, so you can put things on top of it if you want to. On the rear, you'll find an RGB LED ring around the connection between the stand and monitor, which is bright and looks good. It's one of the lighting integrations that doesn't feel like a simple marketing check mark. The stand also only supports height and tilt with no swivel adjustment, though vasor mounting is supported. I would have appreciated slightly more height in the stand, but that's probably challenging with a display of this size. One of the good improvements to the G9 versus the G8 is the move back to standard display connectors. The G8 for some reason used both mini DisplayPort and micro HDMI. The G9 though has a full-sized DisplayPort 1.4 connector and a full-sized HDMI 2.1 connector along with a micro HDMI port and three USB-C ports, none of which can be used for display connectivity. They are simply a USB-C hub with no power delivery capabilities or KVM switch. The drawback is that that while the connectors are now a proper size, they've been inset into the monitor in a way that's a lot less accessible. As for port capabilities, the HDMI 2.1 ports are 40 gigabits per second, so they are compatible with the full bandwidth of the PS5. However, regardless of whether you use DP 1.4 or HDMI 2.1, DSC is required for either input to reach 240 Hz at the maximum 5120 by 1440 resolution. Like the OLED G8, the G9 continues to use Samsung's Smart TV OSD, which can be controlled either through a directional toggle on the display or the included remote. 
This means the OLED G9 is internet connected and can run various apps like Netflix, YouTube, and Disney Plus, and supports other features enabled by the chip's processing capabilities. This is unusual to see as the primary use case for a display like this is gaming, especially PC gaming, where the input device itself, like a PC or game console, can run these sorts of apps perfectly fine and often with faster, easier input access than the included remote. However, the benefit to having app support is that in some circumstances, you'll get better feature support for HDR and other formats through the built-in app compared to the desktop PC app. There are other benefits to a more advanced OSD, such as a more extensive range of settings with fewer restrictions, firmware updates over the internet, Bluetooth functionality, and it's relatively smooth to use. Certainly the level of software features is far ahead of its competitors, and if you specifically wanted things like, say, native app support. Unfortunately, there's no Dolby Vision support. The major downside to this OSD is that while it is somewhat smooth, it's difficult to navigate and there's a lot of useless garbage clogging up the interface. Getting to important display settings for calibration or adjusting the image takes a lot of button presses, even using the quick shortcut that opens the bottom setting bar. When you turn on the display for the first time, it doesn't automatically show you the content from the primary input, instead defaulting to the app page, and it's not immediately obvious how you get, for example, to your PC's desktop instead. It's nice to have all this advanced functionality and app support, but the interface could do with a complete redesign to make the focus the most commonly used monitor functions. Samsung's second generation of QD OLED panels do provide some improvements to the issues we highlighted in our initial QD OLED monitor reviews, chiefly around the subpixel structure. While this QD OLED panel still uses a triangle RGB layout, the sizing of the subpixels has been adjusted, which slightly improves text clarity relative to first-gen QD OLED. There is still some pink-green fringing at the top and bottom of text, but it's not quite as noticeable as with first-gen panels, enough to say it's been improved without being fully fixed. With those first-gen panels, I was one of the reviewers that found the text fringing issue more noticeable and more annoying with desktop app usage. There were certainly others that didn't think it was a big deal at all. With the second-gen QD OLED design, I think it edges closer into the acceptable range. It's still not as good as a similar pixel density LCD that uses an RGB stripe subpixel layout, but typically it's reasonable enough for occasional desktop app usage and continues to be a non-issue for content consumption like gaming. On top of this, I believe the text clarity of second-gen QD OLED is much better than similar W OLED panels, so of the two main OLED technologies, I would choose QD OLED for anything text-heavy. Unfortunately though, the screen composition, layer structure and coding has only received minor improvements relative to first gen QD OLED. This second gen panel is still glossy and still has issues reflecting ambient light when light sources are in front of the display. The reflection handling itself is reasonable, so you won't always notice those horrible mirror-like reflections in bright usage environments, but the layer structure to this panel still reflects far too much ambient light. If your environment isn't well optimized, this ambient light reflection makes the panel appear gray even when attempting to display pure black, which reduces the quality of the deep, rich blacks that OLED is known for. Now the second gen design does reflect a bit less ambient light relative to first gen QD OLED. TFT Central has a great article that goes through and benchmarks this, but the improvement is not enough to be considered a fix. I don't think it's even close in my opinion. So the same thoughts I have in regards to screen composition and coding apply to the OLED G9 as previous QD OLEDs. In a standard indoor viewing environment with artificial light or plenty of sunlight, QD OLED isn't ideal due to its issues with reflecting ambient light and raising blacks. This ambient reflectivity is exacerbated when there's more light in front of the panel, but isn't as problematic when lighting is only behind the display, and it's a non-issue in dimly lit or dark rooms. In contrast, glossy LG W OLED panels typically appear blacker when faced with a bright usage environment as its panel structure rejects more ambient light. It's really hard to say whether this will be an issue for you as it can be a case-by-case -case basis. Personally, I do find it annoying and one of the larger issues with QD OLED panels, but if you primarily game at night, it's not anywhere near as much of a concern. At the very least, it's something to be aware of. What's also important to be aware of is that OLEDs generally aren't great monitors for desktop usage, productivity apps, or web browsing because they are susceptible to permanent burn-in. Anything with static content like toolbars or icons on screen for a long period of time, like you get with most desktop applications, is at risk of burning in. Conversely, dynamic content like gaming or watching videos is at practically no risk of burn-in, so don't worry about this if you're primarily using an OLED for gaming. Even the occasional bit of desktop app usage is fine, it's more 
eight hours a day of productivity work that may lead to burn-in. As for burn-in warranty, unfortunately, Samsung do not provide specific burn-in coverage as part of their warranty listed on their website. Some QD OLED models in the past, like the Alienware AW3423DW, have featured burn-in warranties, but Samsung are not offering that with the OLED G9, which is the same policy as with their OLED G8. This further hurts desktop usability, as you don't get any peace of mind that burn-in will be covered if it does occur. In terms of response time performance, it's no surprise to see this QD OLED panel offering lightning fast speeds, similar to other QD OLEDs we've tested. At its maximum 240Hz refresh rate, we're seeing a 0.3 millisecond average response, which is extremely fast, and that leads to very clear motion for this sort of refresh rate. With no noticeable inverse ghosting, the Samsung model is on par with the other variants for speed and far superior to any LCD at the same refresh rate. It exceeds alternatives like the ASUS PG49WCD due to having a higher 240Hz refresh rate versus 144Hz, a noticeable increase for gaming when you have the performance to drive games at that frame rate. The best part of how OLEDs function is that performance is basically identical at all refresh rates. This means whether we're testing at 240, 120, or 60Hz, we're still seeing about a 0.3 millisecond response time average. LCDs typically get slower as the refresh rate decreases, but that isn't the case here. So the OLED G9 offers a single overdrive mode experience, without any overdrive settings of course, as they aren't required for an OLED. There is effectively no difference in response time performance between this QD OLED and other OLED monitors. The only difference for motion clarity at the maximum refresh rate is the max refresh itself. As the OLED G9 has a high 240Hz refresh rate, you can ensure when buying this display that its motion clarity is excellent. Where the big difference lies is between OLED and LCD. The Odyssey is much faster than the fastest LCDs I've tested, which is a big win for OLED and it only gets better when looking at average performance. While LCDs do get a bit slower at lower refresh rates, OLEDs don't, so the gap between OLED and LCD grows. It's also good to confirm excellent cumulative deviation results, though no different from most other OLEDs. As expected, this really is the same technology that delivers the same response time performance as other QD OLED ultrawides. The OLED G9 technically supports black frame insertion, although the feature is it's so convoluted to access that it's basically pointless and unusable. It only works with 60Hz 4K inputs, which completely rules out any sensible PC connections and doesn't even look that great when set up to use strobing, so I'd just forget about it. Input lag is good, reporting in with a 1.1 millisecond processing delay in both the HDR and SDR modes at the maximum refresh rate. This is a little higher than some other QD OLED gaming monitors, but not enough to have any significant impact on gaming. With a high 240Hz refresh rate and lightning fast response times, this is a low input latency monitor that feels very responsive to use. Power consumption is on the high side when displaying a full white image, as you might expect from a display this large. However, I was surprised to see the screen consume an additional 30 watts relative to the PG49WCD, which uses the same display technology, just at a 144Hz refresh rate without smart TV functionality. It ends up using 44% more power than the OLED G8 with a screen that has a 52% higher area, so scaling seems in line with Samsung's other model, which also was on the higher end of power consumption among 34-inch ultrawides. The OLED G9, as expected for a QD OLED, is a wide gamut display with 99% DCI-P3 coverage. We're also seeing 98.5% coverage of Adobe RGB, so work in either of those color spaces is going to be good. This leaves us with 84% coverage of Rec 2020, which is one of the strongest showings from modern displays, although no different to other QD OLEDs as the panel technology is fundamentally the same. While the G9 has a high color gamut, it has terrible factory calibration, almost entirely due to a single setting which is enabled by default, called Contrast Enhancer. This feature destroys gamma and washes out the image, making it look awful when you first turn the display on. I have no idea why Samsung thought it was a good idea to enable this by default, but we get really high delta E's as a result. Saturation and color checker are also impacted by oversaturation, as the wide gamut capabilities are left unclamped, so standard SDR sRGB content is expanded up to fill the wide gamut of this display. Compared to other gaming monitors, you can see the damage that enabling terrible features by default has. The OLED G9 ends up as one of the worst monitors I've tested for default factory performance in both grayscale and color checker. Luckily, the use of a smart TV processor has allowed for a wide variety of color controls, including a fully unlocked sRGB mode and a wealth of calibration options. Changing just two settings, turning off contrast enhancer and setting the color space to auto, significantly improves color performance. 
While not amazing and still falling short of what I'd describe as factory calibrated, this sRGB mode of sorts does look and perform a lot better. When comparing this configuration to its peers, the OLED G9 doesn't look as out of place. It is still a mid to lower tier performer, but it's far from worst of all time level, so that's a good step in the right direction. With further tweaking, white balance adjustments and so on, I was able to get the screen into a position where I would describe it as pretty well calibrated. Delta E ITP averages were around 5.0, the CCT average is looking pretty good, and overall colour performance is decent. This shows the strength of having fully unlocked colour controls, it really does allow users to improve colour performance if they want to. A full calibration through CalMan was able to somewhat improve performance from what I just showed. I wasn't able to achieve outstanding results, but they were good enough for regular usage. It would have been nice to see these results from the factory. Maximum brightness in the SDR mode is typical of QD OLEDs, topping out at just over 250 nits. Like Samsung's previous OLED, the G9 does not require you to switch on a uniform brightness setting in the SDR mode. It's automatically enabled, so there is no automatic brightness limiter when viewing SDR content, and so brightness will not change depending on the amount of white on screen. Minimum brightness is basically the same as the OLED G8 at 65 nits, which is on the high side for an OLED, most others can push well below 50 nits. Viewing angles are outstanding from QD OLED panels, so you won't have any issues with color shifting or tint when viewed from off angles. The only concern here would be the curve, reducing the visibility of the entire screen, though 1800i is good for gaming at this sort of size and aspect ratio. Uniformity was great as well, continuing a trend of these QD OLED panels delivering a nice and consistent experience. This Samsung monitor is a great HDR display. This is due to OLED technology's inherent hardware qualities that are tailor-made for displaying HDR content. The key feature here is that each individual pixel is self-lit, meaning at a pixel level the display can turn on or off to accurately display everything from dark shadows to bright highlights. When the display needs to show pure black, it can fully switch off, giving us the trademark rich zero-level blacks and deep shadows that OLED is known for. This is in contrast to most HDR-capable LCD panels, which are not fully controllable at the pixel level. LCDs require a backlight, and for HDR displays that typically means the use of full array local dimming, a technology that splits the backlight into zones. Whereas OLED can turn off each pixel individually, LCDs with local dimming can only turn off certain zones, encompassing hundreds or even thousands of pixels. This can still be effective for HDR content and look great, but it has some fundamental flaws in difficult circumstances. For example, when showing a bright and dark element close together, an OLED can control each pixel as needed with a clean, accurate distinction between bright and dark. LCDs with local dimming need to masterfully control the zones to achieve the necessary distinction between bright and dark, and when the element is too small or not in the optimal position, the bright element can spill into the dark area within the backlight zone, creating ugly blooming artifacts. OLED therefore has the edge when it comes to displaying clean HDR content with minimal blooming or haloing. In some scenes, this will be the difference between raised blacks and deep blacks, such as for star fields and Christmas lights. At other times, OLED can have a brightness advantage for small bright objects within a dark scene. Subtitles will look cleaner on an OLED with reduced blooming, and generally OLEDs produce richer shadows thanks to its inherently higher contrast ratio. Aside from brightness and shadow detail, OLEDs also have other advantages for HDR. As there are no backlight zones, OLEDs are faster to transition between bright and dark with no visible zone transitions, OLEDs are much less likely to suffer from backlight flickering, although light PWM behavior, especially when using a variable refresh rate, is common, and OLEDs like this do not increase input latency in its HDR mode, as they don't need to run a backlight zone algorithm. Unfortunately, the OLED G9 suffers from the same issue as the OLED G8 when it comes to HDR compatibility across GPU brands. On an NVIDIA GPU, the G9 is somewhat poorly calibrated for HDR to begin with, but can be tweaked to deliver a 1000 nit experience with good accuracy. On an AMD GPU, the G9 is much more accurate to begin with in its HDR mode, but no combination of settings will ever deliver a thousand nits of peak brightness. The most I achieved on an AMD GPU was around 450 nits. This appears to be due to the OLED G9 using a different HDR pipeline depending on whether you have an AMD GPU hooked up or any other type of input. AMD GPUs use the display's FreeSync Premium Pro pipeline, which Samsung seems to have poorly implemented, despite it being certified by AMD. NVIDIA GPUs and other input sources use the regular HDR pipeline, which has a large number of adjustable settings and the ability to hit a thousand nits of brightness. When testing on an NVIDIA GPU using the best combination of HDR settings, the accuracy on show was quite good. Decent EOTF tracking, good control in the lower brightness range which is used for shadow detail, and decent saturation accuracy delivering a wide HDR color gamut. This display also benefits from QD OLED's much larger color volume compared to W OLED. 
On an Nvidia GPU, I'd have no issues recommending this display for HDR gaming. On an AMD GPU, it's much harder to recommend, not because it's less accurate, but because crucial high levels of brightness are not achievable. It's not good enough that Samsung hasn't been able to fix this despite an entirely new product and multiple software updates for it, and the G8 for that matter, given I first brought this up in March last year. Monitors must perform the same on all GPUs and input devices, not switch to some worse processing method for specific products. If this means removing support for the FreeSync Premium Pro HDR pipeline, so be it. Anyway, we'll continue with the results as seen on NVIDIA GPUs. Full screen HDR brightness is the same as other QD OLEDs, topping out at 253 nits. This is much lower than LCDs, so brightness in high APL scenes is lower, though typically HDR content doesn't use full screen white very often. 10% brightness, also identical to other QD OLEDs, delivering around 450 nits. This is an area Samsung need to improve with their OLED technology compared to W OLED and LCDs. Then for 2% brightness, we see 1000 nits is achievable, matching the best OLEDs and exceeding most LCDs, which typically aren't willing to push this high to avoid dimming zone artifacts. For brightness versus window size, we can see identical behavior to other QD OLED monitors. ASUS recently released PG34WCDM that uses a W OLED panel can get brighter, but whether you get an OLED G9 or the ASUS PG49WCD makes little difference as both deliver similar QD OLED brightness. For real-world brightness in scene 1, the G95SC is a little lackluster as this is a higher APL scene, which QD OLEDs can struggle with. However, in scene 2, which is low APL, the OLED G9 flexes to show off its 1000 nit capabilities, and while gaming I also achieved around 1000 nits real-world, which is a good showing. This isn't one of those displays that only has good HDR brightness in test patterns. Final section of this review is the new and revamped Hub Essentials Checklist 2.0, which compared to previous checklists splits out the spec sheet and advertising section from the features checklist. So first of all, we'll provide a spec sheet based on our testing and compare that to what Samsung advertises to see whether they are doing a good job. Aside from the usual response time nonsense, the OLED G9 is well advertised, though I do think the spec sheet saying factory tuning yes is a bit misleading given what we saw earlier in the color performance section. When looking at the feature support matrix, you'll see this is greatly expanded compared to the original Essentials checklist with a lot of highly requested checkboxes, such as DSC compatibility, USB-C support, key OLED usability features like uniform brightness setting, and more. This is a much more comprehensive look at what makes a monitor good and how the particular product we've just been looking at stacks up. Many key features are supported by the OLED G9, especially for contrast and motion performance. There are a few borderline results, such as input latency, which is approximately 1 millisecond, and Rec 2020 color volume, which fell just short of 80%. It was also pleasing to see key inclusions, such as graceful SDR-HDR switching, with no need to constantly change settings, passive cooling, a fully unlocked sRGB mode, and user-upgradable firmware. There are also some key areas to improve though, like the lack of burn-in warranty, inability to access a thousand nits of brightness on AMD GPUs, and poor factory tuning. We could have seen a lot more green ticks here with more attention to detail, which would have widened the appeal of this monitor to buyers after something very specific for their needs. Overall, the Samsung Odyssey OLED G95SC is an interesting, relatively niche, high-end gaming monitor that I have mixed feelings about. There's some genuinely great stuff here, largely due to the use of a high-quality QD OLED panel that brings all the usual benefits we've seen from this technology. But there's also some frustrating aspects to how Samsung have configured this display and how it performs in some key areas. The best aspect to the OLED G9 is its immersive ultra-wide size and aspect ratio for gaming, combined with its super-fast response times and high 240Hz refresh rate. This panel is really well suited to high-end gaming and has plenty of headroom for years of GPU upgrades. This alone makes it probably a stronger choice than some of its competitors, like the ASUS PG49WCD, which top out at just 144Hz. If you're going to spend over $1000 US on a monitor, you may as well get the one that goes all the way to 240 Hz. This is true for people thinking of using it for both competitive gaming and single player gaming. While 32 by 9 isn't always the best for multiplayer titles, as some don't support the format at all, the motion clarity and responsiveness here is right up there with the best monitors. And for single player gamers, you get all the benefits of a true HDR panel with per pixel local dimming, up to a thousand nits of peak brightness, deep blacks, and the capabilities for decent HDR accuracy. It can be a great looking monitor when set up properly. 
What I'm less convinced about is using this panel for desktop productivity work. As well as being super wide and immersive for gaming, the resolution is equivalent to two 1440p monitors side by side, and that is great for showing two desktop apps at the same time. What's not as great is text clarity, which isn't quite as good as an LCD, its risk of permanent burn-in, and crucially, no burn-in warranty. If Samsung wants to convince buyers that a super ultra-wide QD OLED is the best choice for both gaming and productivity work, and that these panels are the best choice for multi-app usage going forward, they should have backed it with a burn-in warranty to give buyers peace of mind that they can use it however they like without risk of damaging it. Aside from the productivity side of things, there's a few frustrations to this monitor. The big one is that you cannot access a thousand nits of peak brightness on an AMD GPU, the exact same issue found on their OLED G8. Despite being FreeSync Premium Pro certified, this effectively locks you in to NVIDIA GPUs for the best HDR experience, which isn't ideal on a premium product and it restricts your choices for GPU hardware changes in the future. It looks to be unintentional vendor lock-in due to a poor implementation of FreeSync Premium Pro HDR, but given I first talked about this issue 10 months ago in another product, and it's still present in the latest firmware here, I don't have confidence that it will be addressed. Whether or not the OLED G9 is a good choice for you may depend on how comfortable you are being locked in to using NVIDIA GPUs. On top of this, the G9 is badly calibrated from the factory, and while you can use the powerful smart TV functionality to fix this thanks to a wide variety of color controls, it's fiddly to do so, and really on a high-end monitor it should ship in a more usable state. And speaking of the smart TV OSD, it's great that it's so feature-rich and has things like app support, but it has led to a lot of bloat that makes it less intuitive to use versus a regular non-smart monitor, and key settings are buried deep in menus. Despite these issues, I think $1,300 US is a okay to decent-ish price for what Samsung are offering, though you are faced with a $300 to $500 US premium compared to 34-inch ultrawides. You need to be really set on a 49-inch panel size and comfortable with the drawbacks to justify the more premium price tag. At its MSRP of $1,800, there's no way I'd purchase the G9 though, it really needs to be no more than $1,300, which is probably why it's fallen to that price several months ago. So I'm not giving this monitor a strong recommendation, but I'm also not not recommending it, if that makes sense. It has a niche. There aren't a lot of 49-inch QD OLED options, and both of the ones I have looked at have some flaws. This is one of those categories where it really pays to do your research and pick the one that is best suited to your needs and use case. Anyway, that's it for this review of the Samsung Odyssey OLED G9. Thank you to all our Patreon and Floatplane supporters who support the channel directly and allow us to produce independent reviews like this one. We did use the money that we get from Patreon and Floatplane to purchase this very monitor for this review. So if you're wondering about where does your money go when you sign up and support monitors unboxed and hardware unboxed? It goes into buying hardware like these things that we use for some of these reviews. So if you want to get some cool benefits and perks in addition to supporting the channel, we've got our Discord community, IC profiles, we've got monthly live streams and things like that. Then there are plenty of perks to enjoy if you sign up, but that's it for this one. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.